once again, we have a wonderful privilege to look into the Word of God, and we are in John's Gospel, chapter 1. So if you will turn there with me, John chapter 1, we will be looking primarily at verses 37 through the end of the chapter, but I would like to get a running start by looking at verse 35. So if you'll follow along, I will read this text to us from John chapter 1, beginning with verse 35. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and beheld them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. They came therefore for and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which translated means Peter. The next day, he purposed to go forth into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. We have learned thus far in our study of John's Gospel and his prologue some of the stunning truths pertaining to Christ, the incarnate Word that left the majesty of heaven to come and dwell amongst men. A gift of grace so incomprehensible, I constantly find myself being overwhelmed when I think about it. Next, he revealed the historical account of John the Baptist, that austere, mysterious forerunner of the Messiah who preached a message of repentance. Make straight the way of the Lord. Prepare your hearts, he says, to receive the Messiah who, is, who has arrived. Recognize him for who he is and follow him. And the rest of chapter 1 speaks of five disciples that did just that. Five that followed Jesus. Here we see the Savior who, who first seeks those in order that he might save them. This is a fascinating historical narrative which also includes much insight with respect to the inscrutable mystery of the sovereignty of God in salvation balanced with the responsibility of man. But we're also going to see some fascinating truths pertaining to evangelism. We're going to see some unique ways how the gospel seed is sown and harvested, how God draws sinners to himself. And as I've thought about this text and lived with it, especially this last week, I've just found my heart encouraged, and I hope you will be as well. Here, 
the Spirit of God reveals through his inspired writer four methods that God uses to call sinners unto himself. And we're going to see how he deals a little bit differently with each man based on their unique needs, based on their personalities, based upon their heart. And frankly, we're all going to see ourselves as we look at this this morning. Of course, this should be no surprise to any of us because as we look around at creation, we see God is a glorious God that glorifies himself through variety. Whether it be plants or people, stars or snowflakes, whether it be the living organisms on the earth or or the gems beneath the earth. No two things are alike. Everything is different. And the same is true in the operation of His grace. Who can ever predict where the wind of the Spirit is going to come from? How it's going to impact a person and bring conviction to their heart? Not one single person in here has come to Christ in the same way. All of our stories are different. So we see that God does not confine himself to one particular method. But there seems to be four general categories of divine providence that God uses as the primary method of bringing sinners to himself. Number one, we're going to see that he uses public preaching. Number two, personal evangelism. Number three, directly by Christ and His Word, and finally, a combination of all of the above. I hope this brings comfort to those who might be concerned that their personal testimony just doesn't quite line up with some others that they might look up to. I remember one young woman who had come to our church for a number of months. She had gone home. She had gotten on her knees in her bedroom, and she had cried out for God to save her which he did, and she was rejoicing in that. And she came back to me and she said, but pastor, I haven't come down the aisle and, and come to the altar. Am I supposed to do that? And I remember pointing out to her, what altar? There, there's no altar. Christ paid in full our sins at Calvary. He said, it is finished. There there is no altar. You don't need to come forward. But many times we have, especially in our culture today, these almost superstitious things that we see with respect to how a person comes to Christ. The variety of methods the Lord uses to save should also silence uh, critics who insist that uh, they really can't, people can't come to Christ unless you give extended invitations or unless you have um, long evangelistic revival meetings and so forth. But as we're going to see, God is the one that is sovereign over salvation, not man. So notice first the method of public preaching. Again, on, in verse 35, again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked upon Jesus and he walked as he walked and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. This is the second day now that he has said this, that he has preached on this. Jesus is in their midst now at least two times. And we see uh, the preacher emphasizing this important truth of the gospel. Verse 37, then the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Now later on we learn in verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The other disciple we know was John, who never mentions his name in the gospel. Now I want you to remember this is the third consecutive day that John the Baptist has been preaching to a vast number of people and baptizing many people. No doubt Andrew and John had heard him preach for many hours. Now the Spirit of God is moving upon their hearts. They heard the preacher and they followed Jesus. I believe that preaching is the first example that God uses because it is God's primary method of evangelism. From the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament um, apostles and evangelists and, and pastor teachers, God uses 
uses preachers and preaching to bring sinners unto himself. In 1 Corinthians 1, in verse 20, Paul says, Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And of course, the message preached is the foolishness of the cross. He went on to say, For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We know that Paul exhorted Timothy to preach the word. This is what John the Baptist has been doing now in the text before us. This is what all preachers must do. Point people to Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All through Scripture we see that preaching is the principal means that God uses to draw his elect unto himself. For example, in Acts 13, we read how Paul went to Antioch and he went to the synagogue to preach. And there we read that the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. Wouldn't that be amazing if the whole city of Nashville assembled to hear the word of God? Can you imagine that? And we read in that text that the Jewish leaders heard what he was saying and they started heckling him and called him a blasphemer, and so it must have been a very interesting service that morning. But because of this, they said that they would start preaching to the Gentiles. And then Luke tells us this in Acts 13, 49, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. So it's fascinating to realize that even in our text before us that Andrew and John had been appointed to eternal life. Now they didn't know that. John the Baptist didn't know that, but God did. So God was at work. And I find great comfort in this truth whenever I preach or whenever I share the gospel with someone over a cup of coffee. I know that it is ultimately God that is going to do his work. We always know that the Word of God is either going to harden a heart or soften a heart. It will always do one of the other. And so it is our responsibility to sow the seed. But it is God who prepares the soil of a man's heart. It is God who will cause that seed to germinate and to bear fruit. Now notice what happens in verse 38. And Jesus turned and beheld them following and said to them, What do you seek? Now, obviously, the omniscient Christ wasn't lacking information here. He, he, he knew the answer, but what he was wanting to do is help them examine the motives of their heart. Why are you following me, really? He knew that they sought forgiveness from the Lamb of God. He clearly understood how they were seeking the righteousness of, of Christ. So Jesus knew whom they sought, but he's asking, what? What do you seek? What are your motives for following me? I would ask you to ask yourself the same thing. What do you seek by following Jesus? Have you ever thought about that? What are you seeking? Ease of life? Success? A better job? More happiness in your life. Most people pursue God these days for health and wealth. Many people pursue Jesus and they follow him because they want to join the Christian country club. They need a place to hang out with friends and be a part of something, feel like they're accepted, like they belong. Or do you seek Jesus and follow him because you want to know him? because you want to learn from him, because you want to enjoy the rich and intimate, soul-satisfying fellowship of the lover of your soul? Do you follow him because you want to be close to him? You want to experience that heartwarming exhilaration, that felt joy of his presence in your life. 
Paul understood this. Here's what he said in Philippians 3, beginning in verse 8. I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He went on to say that he wanted to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. In other words, he longed for the resurrection, which, it, which it even accompanies the rapture of the church. He's longing for those things. And he says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. In other words, I want to become more like Christ. That's why I follow him. I want to be conformed into his glorious image. I want to experience the power of his resurrection in my life. And he went on to say, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, folks, this is our motive for following Jesus. It's all about him, not us. Can there be any greater prize in all of the world than becoming like Christ? Well, this is why Andrew and John were seeking Jesus. Again, notice the end of verse 38. And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, by the way, this denotes their deep respect for him at this point. They ask him a question, where are you staying? Now, friends, this is more, way more than asking Jesus, what motel are you in? You know, that, that's not what's going on here. This is a request for fellowship. This is a request to spend time with him, to ask him questions, to enjoy his presence, to get to know him. I mean, stop and think of it. If we saw Jesus coming in here, wouldn't you want to spend time with him? I would. Jesus, where are you staying? <laughs> I, I just want to be near you. That's what's going on here. My, how often I cry out for that very thing. How often I cry out, Lord, I wish I could just reach out and touch you right now. I wish I could just see you. I can see you in your word and, and I can experience you in my life, but oh, I want so much more than that. Lord Jesus, come quickly. I want to see you face to face. Well, they had the Lord right there in their presence. And like the psalmist, their souls were, were panting for God. Like a deer pants for the water brook. Their souls were thirsting after God, the living God. So he said to them in verse 39, Come and you will see. They came therefore and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. I believe that this was according to Jewish reckoning of time. It would have been about four o'clock in the afternoon. I find it interesting. John remembers the very hour that he first met Jesus. Knowing that the Father was drawing them, knowing the Holy Spirit had already convicted them of their sin, Jesus knew they were truly seeking him for the right reasons. And so Jesus says to them, come. Come and learn from me. Come and fellowship with me. Abide with me. You know, it's interesting, as we look at Scripture, we don't see one single time, there's not one single time, where Jesus was ever too busy for someone who was really seeking after him. Not one time when Jesus failed to show compassion and enter into fellowship with someone who was truly seeking him for the right motives. And my friends, he will never do that. He will never turn us away but he will not entrust himself to a hypocrite. Many times when I'm counseling with people, I ask them to describe their walk with Christ. And it's fascinating, and I should say it's pitiful many times, to hear what people have to say. They're absolutely clueless as to what that really means. They will give a list of some external things that they do, kind of things that we do in our culture, you know, church attendance, maybe they sing in the choir, they teach Sunday school, they do various things. But in terms of their own private, personal pursuit of holiness, you can tell it's just not existent. It's not there. They are unable to describe what really needs to be there. 
And that is a soul-satisfying communion with the living God. Their Christian life is all sizzle but no steak. Religious on the outside, spiritually dead on the inside. Well, the point is the Lord does not engage that kind of a person. And so when I hear people say, you know, I, I just never experienced any of this stuff about, you know, just really enjoying Christ and all of that. Well, there's a reason for that. You will never experience the joy of his presence unless you seek him for the right motive. We have an example of this later on in John, John chapter 2, in verse 23. It says, now when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. <clears throat> By the way, that doesn't mean they're Christians, but they believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. In other words, he could see their motives. He could see that they were self-serving motives. They wanted to see more miracles. They wanted to see how they could tap into it, how that somehow they could be the, the beneficiaries of this amazing man. Let's follow Jesus so my life can be better rather than I want to follow Jesus so I can have forgiveness of sins, so that I can be cleansed, so that I can be declared righteous and enter into this amazing relationship with the living God. So Andrew and John are invited to join him. Come and you will see, he says. Which, by the way, given the lateness of the day, would, have, would indicate that they probably came and spent the, the evening and spent the night because in those days there, there were no lights. And so once it starts getting twilight, and I've been in regions of the world where it's like this, once it starts to get dark, you start looking for a place to hunker down for the night. All right? You want to find a place to stay. There's no motels. And so this must have been a very memorable night doesn't say this but I would imagine they stayed up most of the night talking with Jesus I would I, I, I how could you possibly sleep I, I'm sure they, they even after they finally turned in I, I, I mean the mind would I mean you're sitting there talking with your creator absolutely inconceivable We often love to do that, don't we? We stay up. Well, all we have to do is put a fire out at our place, you know. Believers come over, and all of a sudden we look, oh, my goodness, it's, it's 12 o'clock. Oh, that's okay. We're talking about Christ. We're talking about what he's doing in our lives. It's just an amazing thing. How much more if he was there? You see, that's the point. By the way, if you have no real desire to know Christ in this way, you probably don't know Christ. You know, there's no greater, more thrilling subject in all of the world than the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. Now notice what happens after their encounter with the Lamb of God. In verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. In verse 41, he found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. As a footnote, we know that later on, John did the same thing with his brother James. And here we see the second method that God tends to use in evangelism, and that is personal evangelism. And this is always going to be the mark of a true believer. A true believer cannot wait to tell those closest to them about the Savior. Think about it. If you are walking along the street and you find uh, a winning lottery ticket, the reason this comes to mind is the other day I saw this funny looking card and I realized it was a lottery ticket and I couldn't resist. I had to pick it up just to see. Well, it had already been scratched off. But imagine if it hadn't been scratched off and you scratch it off, $300 million. Now, of course, if that was you, you wouldn't tell anybody, right? 
obviously, you, you, you would be just blown away. But my friends, I am here to tell you that being found and saved and loved by the Son of God makes a winning lottery ticket as meaningless as a robin finding a worm. So having tasted of the Lord and found Him to be the satisfaction of their soul, Andrew seeks out his brother, verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. What does that tell you? There's personal involvement here. He didn't say, brother, when you get some time, you need to go check this out. No, no, he was intentional. Now, it doesn't say this, but I would imagine, and being around fishermen, I would really imagine this to be the case. He said, son, get cleaned up, get some clothes on, and come with me now. We are going to see Jesus. Well, so this is what happens. He brought him to Jesus, and it says, Jesus looked at him. The text is, is literally saying Jesus paused for a moment and studied him. Can you imagine coming up? It's like, all right, I want to see who this guy is. Peter comes up, and Jesus studies him for a moment. And then he says this, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. What an introduction. I, I wish I could see Peter's face. I have this vision of what Peter looks like, you know, kind of this gruff, tough, you know, he's always got something to say, but I, I'm sure he has that, that deer in the headlight look, you know, it's like, what, what just happened here? What is going on? The omniscient Savior not only saw Peter for who he was, but he saw also what he would make him to be. Here's why we would say that. His natural name is Simon. And we know, according to his character as we study Simon, that he was a, a rather volatile, vacillating, impetuous, impulsive kind of a guy, undepend, undependable, overconfident, I will never deny you, you know, that type of guy. Self-reliant. I like to put it this way. He was one of those ready, fire, aim guys, okay? He was one of those guys that probably wore a little sign around his neck when he was a little boy that said something like, does not get along well with others, um, loud, obnoxious. You know, he was that kind of a guy. Definitely not a team player. Not the type of guy that you would want to pick for your team. But Jesus knew exactly what he was. Knew all about him. But he also knew what he would make him to be. And that's why he nicknamed him Rock. You're Simon, I'm going to call you Rock. Because that's what Cephas or Peter means. A man of God that's going to be fixed and stable and resolute and solid and dependable. It's interesting, as you read through Scripture, whenever Peter needed to be rebuked or admonished by the Lord, Jesus would always call him Simon. Simon. We see this played out, for example, when Jesus predicted that, that Peter would deny him three times in Luke twenty-two thirty-one. 31. Uh, Jesus used his former name, which again would be associated uh, with, his, with, his, with his weak character. He says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. And then in the garden, when Jesus saw him sleeping, after being told, you need to watch and you need to pray. Don't be so self-reliant here. Don't be so overconfident. And Jesus said to him, Simon, not rock, but Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? And then after denying Christ with curses on the night of Jesus' betrayal. You will recall that later Jesus asked Peter three times, Simon, not Peter, but Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? But it's interesting, after that, never again did Jesus call him Simon. 
few weeks later then, he was filled with the Holy Spirit along with the rest of the apostles at Pentecost. And he became the rock that God intended for him to be. A mighty preacher, powerful preacher, that served as the leader of the twelve. The rock who served Christ for 40 years, knowing that at the end of his life, he would be crucified for his faith. You know, I find great comfort in this. I look back when I was saved, and I'm sure the Lord saw me and said, David, you're a wimp, but I'm going to make you a warrior. You're a, you're a little nine-year-old boy that, that, that has the fear of man, but I'm going to make you fear me, and you'll never fear man again. And think of all the things that he could say about you. So he saves us despite who he knows we are, knowing what he is going to make us to be. I find that so comforting as I look at this text. What an amazing grace for each of us. That he makes us into new creatures. The old things pass away, the new things come. So Andrew brings his brother Peter to Christ. But we know that he did so not realizing that it, but he did so because of God influenced, God's uninfluenced sovereign choice of Peter. That he chose him before the foundation of the world. He wrote his name in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus makes this clear later on in John 6, 37. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. There's the sovereignty of God in salvation. The Father gives and they're going to come. But then he goes on to say, and the one who comes to me, there's man's responsibility, we have to come, I will certainly not cast out. Amazing, isn't it? What a tension. John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Yet he says in verse 46, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. On the one hand, you see God's sovereignty. On the other hand, you see man's responsibility to believe. John the Baptist, Jesus, all of them taught that you must repent. And yet, we know according to 2 Timothy 2.25 that it is God who grants men repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. And John 1 that we've already studied in verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, that's something we've got to do, to him gave, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. That's what we've got to do. Comma, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There's man's, or God's responsibility, God's sovereignty. So here again, we encounter this fascinating mystery of God's sovereignty and salvation and man's responsibility. It's a divine tension we cannot understand, but one that is perfectly balanced in the mind of our omniscient God. And we must uphold both God's sovereign choice as well as human responsibility in this tension. To emphasize one over the other, disrupts the sacred balance and causes man to create a theology that will be man-centered rather than God-centered. We've got to remember that Scripture teaches that that, um, unregenerate, unsaved man is is spiritually dead. He's alienated. He's hostile in mind uh, towards God. He's engaged in evil deeds. He's darkened in his understanding. He's excluded from the life of God. There's so many passages. The things of God are foolishness to him. He has no capacity to discern spiritual truth. And so given all of this, man is utterly unable in himself to even respond to God, much less save himself. He's got to be born again, something we can't do. God has to do it. Yet here in the passage before us, we see how God is drawing his elect unto himself and how that is compatible even with man's responsibility to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. A mystery beyond our comprehension. And frankly, I glory in this. I don't get frustrated over it. 
I can't understand any of the divine attributes. How, I, I can't explain to you how God can speak things into existence. Can you? Can you explain that to me? Can you explain to me the incarnation of Christ, how he's fully God and fully human? I, I don't get any of that. And we could go on and on and on with this. Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 8, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are, you, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, we've seen how God uses preaching and personal evangelism as methods of his providence to save sinners. Notice, thirdly, how at times people will be saved by just directly by the word of Christ. Verse 43, the next day he purposed to go um, in, into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, here we see a perfect illustration of Jesus' own announcement of his purpose for coming to earth. Why did he come to earth? Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Here the Savior is doing this. Now, as we were just reminded, no one comes to Christ unless the Father draws him. Indeed, our seeking Christ is only a spiritual reaction animated by his first seek seeking us. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. Now, we're not told how God may have been preparing Philip's heart. We're not told anything about that. But we see here that no one brought Philip to Jesus. No one told him about the Messiah. Philip wasn't looking for Jesus. Rather, Jesus purposes to go to Galilee and purposes to find Philip and to save him. Now, no doubt there's other prior conversation that we don't have here, but ultimately John records the glorious and most important bottom line statement, follow me. The Savior sought him and saved him. In John 15, 16, Jesus makes his sovereign choice so clear, even about his choosing of Philip and the others, and ultimately all of us. There he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. And this is what Jesus did all along for Philip. I have known many cases with men and women where they were not looking for Christ. They were not led to Christ. They didn't know anything about Christ. <laughs> they didn't hear a preacher. They didn't have a gospel track. But somewhere along the line, they read a passage of scripture and they are saved. I knew of one man who was in that category. He went into his hotel room, saw a Gideon Bible. He started reading it and every night he came back for about three days and God gloriously saved him. And then he went out hunting for a church and trying to find a Christian because he didn't know anybody. So sometimes God saves us directly by his word. Jesus finds Philip and tells him to follow him. And this is what every genuine convert will do. He will follow Christ. Do you want to follow Christ for the right reason? To observe all the things that he has commanded you. Do you follow him in baptism? Do you follow him in the Lord's Supper? Do you worship him in these ways? Do you... Follow him in your faith, trusting in him and all that you do. Are you faithful in service? Are you fearless in evangelism as Jesus was? Do you follow him into the garden and even up into the mountain in private prayer and secret devotion of worship? Do you follow him by denying yourself? Are you willing to do the will of the Father even if it costs you your life? That's what it means to follow Jesus. My friend, if that is not you, listen very closely to what Jesus says. Follow me. Is that so hard? You know, it's fascinating as we look at the life of Philip, we see that he was very different than Peter. He was a man that was 
what I would call kind of wimpy, um, a bit of a coward. He lacked faith as we look at it. He was overly analytical. He was skeptical, pessimistic. He was one of those guys that you hate having on, on, a, on an elder board or in a company or whatever. He's one of these guys that could always find five reasons why that will never work, all right? That type of a person. He was slow to trust. He always wanted more proof. Kind of this ultra-conservative type of guy. So why would Jesus pick him? <laughs> because Jesus was going to mold him into the man that he wanted him to be. So Philip followed Jesus. Isn't it amazing how Christ's strength is made perfect in our weakness? In fact, Philip became a mighty preacher. We know that because of his ministry, many, many people came to Christ. And he was among the first to suffer martyrdom. He was stoned to death in Heliopolis in Phrygia, Asia Minor. He followed Christ all the way to glory. Verse 44, now Philip was from Bethsaida, which by the way means house of fishing. Those of you going with me to Israel, we're going to be there, and we will see that place. But this was the city of Andrew and Peter. So it's interesting, isn't it? Philip's newborn soul uh, shares the Savior's burden for the lost and the perishing. He can't be silent. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. By the way, the law and the prophets refers to the Old Testament scriptures where through types and sacrifices and prophecies, Christ is pictured and, and predicted. And he says, we have found him. Again, it's, it's rather interesting. They may not have realized that actually the Savior found them. It was not Jesus who was lost, but them. But they find, they find him, and Nathanael said to him in verse 46, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. So Nathanael was incredulous here. He, he was wondering, you know, how could something good come out of this city that we all look down upon? There must have been a common disdain for Nazareth. He's really saying, is, is it really possible that the Messiah can come from a place like this? You know, every evangelist knows what it's like to introduce a person to Christ, and they are skeptical. They have questions. Some are fair. Some aren't. But in every case, they need spiritual light and life, and the only way they can find this is point them to Christ. So that's what happens here. You just point him to Christ. That's what Philip does with Nathaniel. He says, come and see. By the way, we don't have Christ with us, obviously, today, in person, but we do in his word. So you just point them to his word. I typically point people to the Gospel of John. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. In other words, there's no deceit here. There's no self-deception or duplicity. So this implies that Nathanael's skepticism, even his incredulity concerning the Messiah coming out of Nazareth arose from a sincere heart. He wanted to be very careful here. This is a very, very important issue here. Is this truly the Messiah? Verse 48, Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, before you called, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Well, what a magnificent display of the deity of Christ, which is going to be John's focus throughout his gospel. His omniscient eye was, was not, ab not only able to, to, to peer into the heart of Nathaniel and say, here's a guy with no deceit, but he was also able to look into that secret place of private worship where he had been. By the way, Bear in mind, dear friend, that he sees both of these things in each of us. He sees our heart. He also sees our place of private worship, assuming there is one. And I hope there is for you. So he's awestruck by Jesus' supernatural insight. In verse 49, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. 
By the way, that's the same confession as John the Baptist, right? And such a confession is always going to be evidence of new birth. He saw Jesus for who he was, the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? By the way, this is more of a congratulations than it is a question. He's applauding the sincerity of of, of Nathaniel's confession based upon Jesus' supernatural display of omniscience and his deity. And Jesus says, you shall see greater things than these. In other words, you're going to see even more astounding, overwhelming manifestations of my glory and power. By the way, I find it interesting that the first recorded miracle that Jesus does is in Cana, Nathaniel's hometown. Jesus went on to assure him in verse 51, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here, Jesus is, is, is tapping into that great story of, of Jacob's a vision where Jacob saw the angels ascending and descending from heaven on a ladder, remember, in Genesis 28. By the way, the text doesn't say this, but it wouldn't surprise me if that wasn't the very text that Nathaniel had been meditating upon under the fig tree. Wouldn't it be just like Jesus to do something like that? And that ladder, of course, back with Jacob was the, the, the type or the example that pointed to the greater antitype, the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself would become that living ladder that would bridge heaven and earth. Because we know that it is through, through Jesus that we have access into the throne room of God. In fact, Jesus said in John 3, 13, and no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. Now, in this text, the Son of Man has descended from heaven onto earth to commence his, his ministry of reconciliation because, indeed, Christ Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. He is the mediator even of the new and the better covenant that we read in Hebrews. Well, with Nathaniel's conversion, we see the fourth method that God uses to save sinners, and that is a combination of all of the above. Think about it. God previously used public preaching to save Andrew and John, and then he used personal evangelism, uh, the personal evangelism of Andrew and, uh, to save Peter. And then Christ himself seeks out Philip and saves him directly by his word. And then you have Philip inviting a skeptical Nathaniel to come and see, and then Jesus overwhelms him with his, with his glory and saves him. And so here we have a conversion that is an indirect result of preaching as well as a composite of personal evangelism and the word of Christ. And that's probably true for most all of us. I remember when I was a small boy, I had godly parents, godly grandparents around me. I heard much about Christ. I had godly Sunday school teachers. Uh, we didn't have Awana back then. We had Boys Brigade I, uh, later on. So I had all of these people around me but by the time I was nine years old, I had heard many things about Christ. I started to become convicted over my sin, and eventually at the end of a sermon, um, I, I stayed seated. I was overwhelmed with uh, my sin. My father and the pastor, um, uh, Dr. Conley, came and sat down with me, and they asked me what was going on, and I cried out to God to save me, and he did. And there's that combination of all of the above. Now, folks, by way of application, I want to just give you a few things in closing. Number one, I want you to make evangelism a priority in your life. If you can't see this out of the text, you're missing it. I'm talking about passionate, bold, gospel preaching and teaching and sharing. We're told to go and make disciples. And as we see here, our first obligation is at home. No, don't be you know, teaching kids at Awana and neglecting your own kids at home or whatever. 
I like to think of it in four ways. Target, pray, plan, and implement. Can you remember that? It's real simple. Target, pray, plan, and implement. Be passionate, be creative, be intentional, be bold, be relentless. Give people books and films and, and tracks and fire pits. Ask them over, hey, you know, we're having a cookout tonight. Or we're going to ask a bunch of guys to go shoot here before long. You know, that type of thing. And in the midst of that, we start talking about the gospel. We're, we, we have targeted people. We're praying for them. We're, we're strategizing. But then also remember, God's primary method of evangelism is preaching. So invite them to church. They won't come to church. Put the sermons on Facebook. A lot of you do that. Or, or invite them to look at YouTube. Talk about something and say, boy, you know what? My pastor or some other pastor has talked. You have got to hear this. What's your email address? And I'll, I'll send you this link. I mean, this is evangelism, folks. In fact, what I'm going to ask you to do and I, it occurred to me that I, I've never done this before at this church, but I, I believe it's of the Spirit of God. I'm going to ask every person in this church to target someone and send me an email of that person's name and a brief statement of your plan for evangelism. And I'm going to expect every person to do that, and if I don't hear from you, you're going to be hearing from me. Okay? I mean, folks, we've got to get serious about this. So now that you're all terrified, but this is so exciting. Beloved, let me ask you, Jesus came to seek and to save sinners. Do you believe he's still doing that or not? Well, well of course he is. So let's get with the program. And he uses faithful saints to accomplish his purposes of redemption. I can only imagine the number of souls that we could harvest if we as a body got serious about evangelism. So we need to be passionate and creative and intentional and bold and relentless. I'll do my part. The elders will do theirs. We expect you to do yours. And because we love you, we're going to help you with this. The second thing by way of application, realize that God is always at work in evangelism long before you showed up. You never know who the Father is drawing. Maybe that person on your target list is one of those people. And then thirdly, even as Jesus fashioned these ordinary men with all of their faults and, and weaknesses into these mighty warriors of the kingdom, he wants to do the same for you. But folks, you have to be like them. You have to get serious about following Jesus. You have to walk with him and abide with him. You have to be like Andrew and John saying, Rabbi, where are you staying? Will you ask the Lord that this week? Lord, Lord, where are you staying? I want to be with you. My sufficiency is only in you. And my friend, let me tell you where Jesus is staying. It's called the church. That's where Jesus is staying. This is his body. He is the head. If you want to get serious about becoming that person God wants you to be, start getting serious about serving and worshiping in his church and watch what he will do. You have been given two pastor teachers who have been called and equipped and gifted to give you the word so that you will be prepared for the work of ministry and not be like children so that you will become mature. You've been given godly elders who understand that they have been given this amazing responsibility to have watch care over your souls. You've been given deacons that, that love to serve you. And there are so many people in this church who are a part of the body who have all of these amazing gifts. And you're going to hang around on the periphery? What is wrong with you? My friend, do not live outside the camp. You will never survive. You will stay, Simon. That's what will happen. And we need you. And finally, for those of you who have never begged God for mercy, you've never repented of your sins, you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, you must do this today. I plead with you as a minister of the gospel. 
do it before it's too late. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. You've been listening to pastor, Bible teacher, and author, Dr. David Harrell. For more information or for other messages from Dr. Harrell, please visit the Olive Tree Christian Resources website at otcr.org.